it's hugely opportune to be focusing on colic, the subject of colic during this, which is Colic Awareness Week. And there's lots of um, information that we can point you towards that goes with the Colic Awareness Week, which is being organised by the British Horse Society and the University of Nottingham. So we'll certainly point you towards those um, links later on. Um, and also, if you've got any ideas what we can use for future webinars, we run them every fortnight throughout the winter, um, then please do. We've focused on a number of different things from equine disease, two weeks ago it was on pasture management, weight management of our horses, uh, get, getting our horses fit. So we're trying to do a, a, a very sort of broad range of topics to help you as horse owners. So a very warm welcome to those who have just joined us by Facebook Live and a very, um, you're very welcome to our ninth Wednesday webinar. Um, this evening we're going to be talking about the issue of colic and I'm delighted to be joined by Katie Lightfoot who's um, a teaching associate at the University of Nottingham and from World Horse Welfare one of our international programme officers Izzy Wilde, both of whom are vets and both of whom can bring a real practical perspective on the issue of colic. Now we very much want you to be involved so if you're on Facebook live then please do share the live video. We will be recording this this evening so if you enjoy it which I very much uh, hope you will and I'm sure you will then please do share it with your, your friends and colleagues and during the evening we very much want this to be a two-way uh, conversation so we've got two presentations from from Izzy and Katie and then we'll have plenty of time for questions so if you're on Facebook live as the evening goes on please put up your comment uh, your questions on the comments section and if you're joining us by zoom then please put them up ideally on the Q&A uh, function but all you could also got the chat function there to ch ch chat amongst yourselves as well and of course, as I say, if you do enjoy it, then please point people towards the recording. And if you've got ideas of what we can uh, utilise for topics for future webinars, then please do send those ideas to us at education at worldhorsewelfare.org. Now, um, what I'll do is just, I'll start by just sharing my screen. And I'm delighted, um, did mention this to our Facebook to our uh, Zoom audience, but th this evening it's great that, we, uh, that we're running this evening's um, colic um, webinar during the BHS and the University of, University of Nottingham's Colic Awareness Week. And we're really happy to be involved with this and to, and to support it uh, with our great friends at the BHS and, and Nottingham University. The campaign is all about asking owners to pledge to react and sign up to receive a free equine care and emergency plan that could make all the difference when dealing with colic. This follows the success of last year's Colic Awareness Week, which focused on how to spot the early signs of colic. And we'll share those links with you uh, towards the end of the webinar, which includes daily 10 minute uh, webinars on a range of colic subjects, top tips uh, um, via social media, as well as this free care and emergency plan. So th that is great news. Um, just to get you going, unfortunately, if you're joining us by Facebook Live, you won't be able to take part in this. But if, if you're joining us by Zoom, then we, we just love you to get involved. There's no right or wrong answers to this. It's just to get a feel uh, for, for who's with us this evening. And do you feel confident in recognising the signs of colic? Now, there's a series of options that from, yes, I'm aware of the signs and, and understand um, some of those that can be subtle all the way through to no. So if you can just um, ha have a quick vote on that, that would be really helpful. Now, um, I will then just, um, if I can, um, give, give you a very brief introduction to World Horse Welfare. And um, at the heart of what World Horse Welfare is all about, for us, it's about supporting the horse-human partnership in all its different forms, whether it be a sport or a leisure animal, a working animal, a farm animal, an animal used for therapy, or so many other ways we utilise horses in today's society. And we do that through a variety of means. We work globally. At the moment, we're working in 16 countries in low and middle income countries around the world. We support sport regulators, but education is very much part of what we do 
in all our work and of course that's what we want to do we want to help us as horse owners manage what can be um, some real challenges when we're looking after our horses and you know it does strike dread in so many people when you talk to horse owners and you mention the word colic which you know it for, for humans is around crying babies but for for equines it literally means abdominal pain so there's a, many causes of colic and izzy and katie are going to talk to us about that both about what it means but also what we can do to best prepare for colic because we know that you know especially when we're looking at this time of year we're moving from summer to autumn and then into winter and with the last rush of, of autumn grass that can obviously bring challenges with regard to laminitis but it can also bring challenges with regard to colic so tonight it's all about some practical aspects of what we can share with you about how we can best prepare and, and look out for the signs uh, as early as possible of colic so before I hand you on to um to katie we should have some answers to the question um a really good spread there so um nearly half of you 43 percent yes i'm aware of the signs um but then 34 percent i would like to say yes but i'm not sure i could recognize it in all cases um i totally understand that and that, i really hope that this evening's webinar is going to assist you in that so if we move on to introducing um you, as I keep on saying, you would think I could do this um, by if, by now. Here we go. Marvellous. Um, actually, I've got Izzy talking. So Izzy is going to be talking first, which is right. Izzy's been thrown into the fire because she's only just joined us at World Horse Welfare. So part of her induction, um, we thought, what better? We can ask her um, as a, a University of Nottingham graduate for about a couple of years ago, been in practice for two years and now joined us here at World Horse Welfare. She... she has been involved with the charity for a while because actually during her time at Nottingham she was an undergraduate bursary holder um, of from World Horse Welfare which is great news and Izzy's going to talk to us about what colic is and I'm delighted to hand over to you Izzy um, and, and thank you very much for joining us. Well perfect thank you very much for the introduction I'll just share my screen right that should be sharing is that all good you're good to go perfect so what to do if your horse has colic and this is really going to be a whistle stop tour of colic um and if you want further info as really was saying the bhs colic awareness week is happening and they are actually doing a short series of webinars um, being released every night on their Facebook page. So um, you can get more info there as well. And I just want to say thank you to Sarah Freeman for the permission to use the photos um, from the React campaign in this presentation. So without further ado, um, the contents of this are we gonna be talking about what is colic, types of colic, reducing the risk, symptoms, what the vet will do, referral and a case study. So colic means pain in the abdomen, and it's a symptom of an underlying cause. There are a number of different signs, and some are more subtle and some are more severe. And as you can see in this rough illustration, the horse's abdominal anatomy is huge, um, much of which is free to move just about where it pleases, um, which predisposes the horse to a range of gut health issues. And modern management practices also don't help with gut health. Um, the horse is designed to live outside 24 seven with constant movement and access to rough and sparse grassland. So not the nice lush green grassy fields that so many of our horses live on. And colic is also the most common emergency condition in the UK. It's often seen out of hours and can really strike at any time. Your horse can be normal one hour and then develop symptoms very quickly. So going through the types of colic, um, spasmodic colic is the most, one of the most common types. Symptoms can come and go in spasms, sharp bouts of pain intermittently, and loud gut sounds may be heard. Tympanic colic is also known as gas colic, um, and this is where gas accumulates in the intestine, and pain can be mild to more severe, and it can be quite tricky to budge, and the horse can look bloated. 
Impaction, so the most common site of impactions are at the pelvic flexure, which is where the intestine narrows and turns 180 degrees. Mild pain is generally seen over longer periods, and there are subtle signs such as passing fewer or no droppings or losing appetite. And generally, this can be managed in the field. However, some large room impactions or impactions in other places may require hospitalization. Um, Sarn colic is very regional, and it's something I didn't see much of in Hampshire, for example. Sand tends to gather within the gut and causes irritation and possible impaction. Signs again can be mild to more severe pain and diarrhea. And displacements, this is where a section of gut moves to a place it shouldn't and it causes discomfort and or obstruction. Signs can be mild or severe. And again, this is treated medically in the field or occasionally surgically. And strangulations are pretty much as nasty as they sound. This is where the strangulating obstruction completely cuts off the blood flow to a part of the gut. And a torsion is where the gut rotates around the place it attaches to the body wall and cuts off the blood supply. And these are both very severe and surgery is required urgently. Symptoms are, are severe and the horse is in continuous pain and possibly showing signs of shock. So you'll be pleased to know that the most common types of cause of colic are the milder types. And this is a study from the Nottingham Colic Project where over a thousand cases of first opinion colic were reviewed. And as you can see, the most common is no definitive diagnosis, which means that no diagnosis was reached in 57% of cases, which tends to be the more mild colics and spas spasmodic or gas colic fall under this category. Um, impactions and simple displacements make up 15% of these and they can generally be managed in the field. So overall, 70% generally can easily be managed at your yard. Surgical and strangulating colics make up 17% of cases and these will require hospitalization for surgery or euthanasia due to the immense pain and death of the gut. Other causes will have a range of different treatments, but some of these are more complicated and may need hospitalization for medical management or investigation. So reducing the risk. Right now we are seeing many, many colics due to the change of season. Many of the more simple types of colic are related to management issues. And studies show the risk of colic is higher in older horses, Arab horses, following recent changes in management and those who've had a history of colic. So starting with consistent feeding and watering, the horse is a hind gut fermenter requiring lots of fiber. So make sure your horse's diet is mainly hay, haylage or grass. Feed should be gradually changed over 10 to 14 days to allow the gut bacteria to adapt. If your horse really does require concentrate feeds, and most don't, feed little and often. And make sure there's plenty of drinking water. If this is restricted, it can lead to an impaction. Avoid grazing on sandy surfaces for sand colic. And finally, with diet, unsoaked sugar beet and grass cuttings should also not be fed to horses as these can cause colic. So going back to the changing of the season, this can affect the risk of colic. In the spring and autumn, the grass is lush. And if the horse gorges on this, it can result in rapid fermentation, which can cause gas or spasmodic colic. And it's best to restrict this rapid change onto this type of pasture. If the pasture is icy, it's worth supplementing with further hay and allow constant access to water and checking for ice. If a horse is suddenly stables, this can be a significant change in diet and exercise. So we would more commonly see impactions if a horse is on box rest or stables more in winter months. And if a horse is on restricted diet, it may eat straw bedding, which is also a risk factor for impaction colic. So strategic worming involves not just using wormers, but poo picking frequently, fecal worm egg counts during the summer months, and take worm saliva tests, and there is a new red worm blood test that you can get from your vet. Both of the latter two um, can be done between now and December, which is generally the time that you would worm for both of these types of worms. Um, lots of parasites can cause damage to the gut lining, and younger and older horses are more at risk of this. 
Dental checks every six to 12 months are recommended um, by a qualified dental technician. So make sure that they are a member of BA, EDT or a vet. And poor teeth will affect the horse's ability to chew with larger clumps entering the gut and leading to colic. For exercise, horses should have a good warm up and cool down. Don't feed large amounts of um, food directly before or after exercise or large amounts of cold water directly after. And if the horse is heavily exercising, water must be offered, including electrolyte replacement, but ensure that there's also non-electrolyte water as an alternative so the horse doesn't um, go off its water. So with natural anatomy, unfortunately, for the more severe types of colic, this just tends to come down to the horse's gut anatomy. And with these displacements and torsions, um, they are more common in larger horses and mares after foaling. And there are a few other risk factors, such as stressful events, um, stereotypical behaviours, so crib biting and wind sucking, where the management and stress should be reviewed. Sedation can slow down gut function, as can general anaesthetics. So symptoms of colic. Most should be able to name the more obvious signs of colic, such as rolling or flank watching, for instance, but there are actually many more symptoms that could indicate colic. And some of you may have seen this. This is the BHS React clock, which really illustrates this very well. Um, so going around the clock, R is for restless or agitated. So that includes attempts to lie down, repeated rolling, unexplained sweating, box walking or circling. Um, eating less or droppings reduced, so eating less or nothing, passing less or no droppings, changes in dropping consistency. Abdominal pain, so flank watching, pouring, kicking at tummy. Clinical changes, so increased heart rate, reduced or absent, absent gut sounds. Changes in colour of gums, rapid breathing rate, skin abrasions over the eyes, and tired or lethargic lying down more, lowered head position, dull and depressed. And unrelenting signs of pain indicate a more severe problem, which can lead to skin abrasions and the horse may be unresponsive to its surroundings. So what does colic look like? In this first picture, the horse is showing unusual behavior and is tired and lethargic. With the skin abrasions in the second picture along from the top, owners will often phone saying their horse has been cast in the night and has abrasions as a result of this. But more often than not, this is actually a sign of severe colic, which is usually surgical. Flank watching at the bottom left is a common sign of abdominal pain. And gum colour is important. Dark red is a sign of shock and a serious underlying condition. But pale gums are something we're not so concerned about. So really, time is of the essence. If your horse is showing any signs of colic, it's always best to phone the vet in the first instance. The sooner you react, the better the survival times for more severe colic. The vet can provide pain management no matter whether this is mild or severe, and it's better not to give a sachet of oral bute, as this is not so effective for colic, and pain relief via injection into the vein is the drug of choice. To make sure you don't waste time in this situation, it's always best to have an emergency plan, which Kate will go into more detail in a minute. Whilst waiting for the vet, make sure you and the horse stay safe, it's okay to allow your horse to roll in a safe environment and only walk the horse if it's safe to do so. It's also best to remove all food. So what will a vet actually do? Firstly, we take a good history of the horse's management and lifestyle to see if there are any trigger or reason for colic. Often since the horse is in a lot of pain, the vet will be doing this alongside a thorough clinical examination, looking at the color and hydration of the gums, listening to the heart rate, breathing rate, listening to the gut sounds, and taking a temperature. This is all gathering important baseline information as the drugs given will alter these values, and this will help us understand whether this is a more serious or critical case of colic, where the horse may need hospitalization. Sometimes if the horse is really painful, the vet will give sedation in the first instance when it's more safe for everyone involved. Drugs given include pain relief, so bute or phenylexin by injection into the vein, buscovan to reduce the spasms of the gut, and a short-acting sedation, which not only allows for safe examination, but also provides further pain relief. And here is a picture of a sedated horse on the bottom right, 
as you can see, he's not completely fallen over. He's just a bit wobbly, head lowered and legs a bit splayed. So further tests, more often than not, the vet will carry out further tests to investigate an underlying cause of the symptoms. Firstly, the vet is likely to perform a rectal examination, and this is not to relieve an impaction, which is a common misconception. Rather, it's an, a diagnostic test to feel the positioning and contents of the gut. And it's an important test. The vet will be able to assess whether or not the horse feels normal in about a third of the abdomen. So not the whole abdomen can be felt, but it will give us a good idea. Safety is a very important consideration for the vet, horse and handlers. And the horse can, of course, kick and the vet is in a compromised position. Furthermore, there's a very small risk of injury to the horse, so rectal tears, and to minimise injury to all involved, sedation, buscopam and plenty of lubrication is usually used. The vet may also stand behind a wall as well. It's always good to warn if your horse is prone to kick. Passing a stomach tube is also a common diagnostic test and treatment. Um, if the horse looks like it's got serious colic, it's useful to detect if a horse has reflux, which is a backlog of food in the horse's digestive system caused by a blockage further along. A horse cannot be sick, so this will relieve the pressure and prevent possible rupture, rupture of the stomach. As a treatment, the stomach tube can be used to give fluids, so water and electrolytes to the horse. And this is a common treatment for impactions as well as other low-grade colics that can be managed in the field. Nosebleeds are common, but don't worry, a 500 kilogram horse has 50 litres of blood. So whilst nosebleeds can look dramatic, they are rarely a cause for concern. And due to the anatomy and nature of the horse, the tube can sometimes be challenging to pass. Most of the time it's pretty straightforward though, although once I actually ended up with a nosebleed and not the horse, despite warning the owner that the horse might get a nosebleed, I had a nosebleed for no apparent reason. Um, so less commonly, these other tests might be used. So abdominal centesis or peritoneal tap, which is where a sterile preparation on the midline is um, done and then a needle is inserted to get a sample of the fluid surrounding the guts and it gives you an idea of the environment around the guts. Blood lactate can also be used for prognosis and this should be low. If it's high, it's a sign that blood flow around the horse is not so good. For example, if there's a strangulation, which means less oxygen reaching the tissues. Ultrasound is also sometimes used to view the, the gut in the field, but it will be frequently used in hospital. So if the vet decides your horse needs referral, this is because the symptoms shown indicate this is a critical case and your horse will need specialist intervention and tests. This does not always mean surgery. It also means that your horse could be constantly monitored by experts and have um, intensive medical treatment and fluids. If your horse is in a really bad way, other humane methods do include euthanasia with severe colic. So if you're not prepared to refer, this is the kindest option in severe cases where the horse is in immense pain. However, to illustrate what it's like to have a horse that is hospitalized and requires surgery, I will be presenting a quick case study called Kai, who is a horse I saw in practice last year. So Kai was a 24 year old fit and active gelding. So successful veteran and very good for his age. And so that made him a really good candidate for surgery despite his age. And as an owner, it's really worthwhile to consider what you yourself would do for your horse. And especially as colic is more common in older horses. In the emergency situation, it's really easy to be persuaded by other people, so other members on the yard. So make sure you have this plan in place by the time the situation arrives. He developed his colic symptoms very quickly, within 10 minutes, having eaten his breakfast a few hours earlier. And I happened to be finishing at a colic just down the road when um, I got the call from the practice. So I was able to arrive pretty quickly, which um, was helpful, although that's not always the case. Kai's worst symptom was his unrelenting pain despite analgesia and sedation. He kept going down despite pain relief and we couldn't keep him upright. And once he was down, he was lying on the floor with all four feet in the air. However, many of his other vital signs hadn't changed and his, as his owner had acted very quickly. His owner was decisive and with veterinary guidance quickly made the decision to send him to hospital, which helped him give the best chance. For transportation, this had to be arranged as they did not have their own, but luckily this arrived quickly. And 
often owners rightly worry that their horse is going to go down a lot in a trailer. And as a precaution, the vet will give a good dose of sedation before transportation and transport to the nearest hospital. And this will also, the movement will actually make the horse concentrate on standing. And so the horse will generally remain upright. So Kai's diagnosis was reached at surgery, strangulating lipoma, which means a fatty lump trapping a section of his intestine, which needed to be removed where the tissue had died off. The surgeon said how important it was that he was referred so quickly. So he had minimal other bodily changes. Afterwards, he did have to remain in hospital for two weeks to monitor as he had two small bouts of mild discomfort, which isn't uncommon. It's important to note that the colic rehab process is not for all horses. In this case, he required two months of box rest and one month of small paddock rest, which is pretty standard to allow the abdominal wound to heal. Kai's owner really followed this to a T and he was also a very good patient, which maximized his chances of success. When thinking about what you would do for your horse, it's important to take this into consideration. And for example, if your horse is good to travel. So all this happened just over a year ago and Kai is back out hacking and enjoying life and his owner is with us tonight. But he's just not a one-off. About 70 to 80% of horses are alive a year on from colic surgery, depending on the underlying cause. And most of these do make it back to full athletic function. So in conclusion, in response to the title, what to do if your horse has colic? React quickly. Colic has a number of underlying causes. Time saved will improve the outcome in critical cases and make a plan for colic before your horse has it, which Katie will explain further. Thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions after Katie's talk. Izzy, thank you very much indeed. I think if you could just stop sharing your screen and I'll start sharing mine, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, right, okay. Listen, that was great. That was some really useful um, insight there into what um, what the causes of colic are and then what, what a, um, a vet's gonna do when they arrive. So thank you very much for that. Now, before I introduce Katie, in theory, um, I'm going to try and give you a second poll question. So if you're joining us by Zoom, you can uh, look at this question. Have you ever had a horse with colic? Um, now, there's a, a myriad of options here in terms of, yes, my horse required hospitalization and very much goes down the list that Izzy's just taken us through. Uh, and, the, and the bottom option there is no, I don't think my horse is particularly at risk. So please, as ever, no right or wrong answers. Just um, have a quick go at answering that. And then whilst you're doing that, I'll introduce you to Katie, who is um, a lecturer at the University of Nottingham. Uh, she was telling me just before we started that uh, students have come back. There's 300 first year students at the moment at the University of Nottingham, um, which is really extraordinary to think of. Um, I think um, many of us were in, in classes of less than 100, but I know that they're doing a two year split there. So Katie's busy in the University of Nottingham, but having said that, she's had a long association too with uh, World Horse Welfare. It's wonderful to have have her with us tonight uh, and it's got a really strong background like Izzy and Colic and therefore is going to bring us um, a wealth of her experience. Um, I just thought I'd give you a, a little bit of a, an insight into Katie's life which is um, her pets which at home includes hundreds of water snails, hundreds. Um, a dwarf hamster, I assume just one, bearded dragon, don't know how many, a koi carp, one greyhound and then a little bit of sanity and a Welsh pony. So um, with that, you have an insight into Katie's life when she's not at the University of Nottingham. Um, but Katie, it's great to have you with us. And before I hand over to you, uh, hopefully, Jamie, you can give us the answers to the poll question to see 34% um, have not had a horse with colic, which is wonderful, but very sensibly, you are concerned about it. And it's great to have you tonight. And I hope we can, can provide some reassurance around your concerns. And then yeah, just over a quarter have required veterinary treatment, but it didn't have to be moved. And obviously, that may very much reflects um, what Izzy was just telling us about. So. Um, we look forward to hearing from Katie. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then Katie, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you. So first challenge, share my screen. 
Uh, can everybody see that? Not yet. Not coming up just yet. Hang on. Whilst you're doing that, Kate, now you can. Um, there's a couple of people who've got their hands up on Zoom. Um, we can't um, go to you through um, through hands up. So if you can just put your question in the Q and A, or use the chat function to put your question or your comment, that would be great. Um, Katie, we, you've started sharing your screen. We can't see your slide yet, but hopefully, if you can go to. Bear with me. It is just having a bit of a wobbly. Is it doing anything now? Yeah, now you just need to go on to presenter view and you're away. There we go, can you see that? Yeah, that's great. Perfect. So yeah, good evening everyone um, and thank you for the introduction, Rolly. Uh, so yeah, following on from um, Izzy's fab presentation, I'm now going to spend the uh, next 20 minutes or so uh, discussing why rapid decision making is important when faced with a critical diagnosis of colic. Um, and I'll also be talking about what you as horse owners can do to prepare for such an, an event in advance. Um, throughout this presentation, I've also included some quotes from um, a research study that I did during my PhD, um, where I spoke to both horse owners and vets who have experience of critical colic, um, just to highlight the real life impact that, of colic and some of the decisions you may have to make. Um, so just moving on. So I will be covering why you should be preparing for colic, um, the emergency decisions you will have to make and anything that could delay your decision making. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to talk about what you can do to prepare for colic now um, and also show you a case study of um, an owner who has already put together a plan. So why should you prepare for colic now? Um, so this is, it might sound like a little bit of an odd question, but um, colic can happen at any time and it can happen to any horse. And the quote that I've chosen on this slide um, is actually from an owner who found herself euthanizing her otherwise fit and healthy horse days after it successfully competed at a national show. Um, and this was quite um, upsetting for her. Um, and she just couldn't believe that a horse that had won at the weekend was um, now unfortunately euthanized because of colic. Now, research has shown that 8% of horses will recover spontaneously or following a single veterinary visit. However, the, the types of colic that we're talking about tonight are the 20% that will need referral for either intensive treatment um, or surgery or unfortunately euthanasia. However, without any of these options, um, these horses will unfortunately um, die as a result of their illness. So we call these cases critical. And these are the ones like uh, Izzy mentioned earlier that involve severe obstructions, strangulations or disease processes such as, such as grass sickness, um, which unfortunately we, we can't really treat at the moment. Um, and as a result, critical cases require rapid decision making in order to avoid welfare implications associated with delays. But what, delay, what implications are delays associated with? So, the longer um, a critically ill horse goes without veterinary intervention, the more severe the damage becomes to their intestines. So research has actually shown that the lining of the intestine can become severely damaged within 90 minutes of a strangulating obstruction happening. Um, and irreversible damage can actually occur within three to four hours. However, there is good news. So a study in 2015 examined the survival of horses suffering from a 360 degree torsion of the large intestine. So this is where the, the large intestine is twisted all the way around and blocked off the blood supply. And this study highlighted that with rapid recognition of the signs, followed by fast decision making and referral, the chances of survival is actually increased. Now, other than intestinal damage, delays can also um, impact a horse's suitability um, for travel. So the longer a horse is ill and in pain, the, the more exhausted it becomes. And Izzy mentioned that we can obviously give um, sedation to help the horse travel, um, but it just depends on how exhausted the horse is in the first place. Um, and this can not only impact its suitability to travel but also its fitness to undergo surgery um, so the more exhausted the horse is the more changes are occurring in its in its body and um, the more at risk it is of actually having complications 
But altogether, these factors can actually reduce a horse's chance of survival if referral treatment is an option. Um, and we'll talk about other options a little bit later. However, the biggest concern that we have um, with colic, delays will negatively impact a horse's welfare. So the quicker that you can make a decision, the better it is for the horse, otherwise we are prolonging their pain. But colic is an emergency and it's one that doesn't affect just your horse. You as an owner will be at the centre of this event and the emotional impact of colic can be really long lasting and highly distressing. Um, and the quote that I've displayed on this slide um, was from um, a lovely owner I spoke to who, when faced with the decision to either refer her horse for surgery or opt for euthanasia, um, she really struggled with the guilt um, of this decision because she'd never thought of it before and just being put on the spot, she, she really just wanted to do what was best for her horse. So what emergency de decisions will you have to make and what could possibly cause a delay? Well, not surprisingly, the first decision you will be faced with is whether or not to actually call the vet out. So critical cases of colic, as um, Izzy described, can come in all forms, but it is important to remember that not all horses will display this sort of violent behaviour, um, which is relentless rolling with absolutely no regard for their own safety. Some critically ill horses can actually present as dull and unresponsive, or some owners um, may just say that the horse just seems a little bit off, it's just not quite right. Um, and as Izzy pointed out, the skin abrasions above the eyes or pelvis can actually be the result of violent rolling hours earlier. So it is really, really important that if you're in any doubt at all, don't delay in calling your vet. Um, a phone call will open up that channel of communication with your veterinary team and it will make them aware of a potential problem. So it doesn't necessarily mean that a call out is needed. The vets are just there for advice um, and there for support. So if you're not sure, just give them a call and talk to them. Now, going along this sort of um, line, the other decision you'll be faced with is what to do whilst you're waiting for the vet. So you've called the vet and now you don't really know what to do. So um, a lot of research has been done um, looking at an owner's approach to colic, and it's shown that um, a lot of owners will choose to walk their horse whilst waiting for, or even before calling a vet. And this is mainly through fear of a twisted gut or just to see if the colic can res be resolved without any veterinary intervention. However, there's no existing scientific evidence at the minute to support that this, that the theory that rolling can actually cause a twisted gut. Um, this is a misconception and it's generally been born out of fear. Um, and it is actually something that my PhD research picked up that is actually being fueled by social pressure within the equine community. So um, some owners that don't walk their horse um, actually feel guilty because uh, others say that they should be doing. Um, rolling, on the other hand, is actually thought to be a behaviour performed in direct response to pain. So the horse is actually trying to alleviate pain by rolling um, and preventing them from doing so can actually cause them more distress and also the safety implications, which we'll go on to in a moment. So although mild um, cases of colic, so we're talking horses that have shown very, very mild signs, very intermittently and can be distracted from it. Um, these horses can be walked, but only, only for, you know, very gently and only for 20 minutes. Um, but it's really important that a veterinary assessment is actually um, performed before the action is undertaken, as you don't know how severe the problem is and what treatment the horse is going to be needing. So for example, if the horse had a critical case of colic, so again, we're talking about strangulations and torsions, um, and it appears severely painful, falling, forcing them to walk can actually be detrimental to both their health and chances of survival. Um, and trying to keep a horse walking can also increase the risk to both you and your horse, which um, this owner that I spoke to found, um, she tried to walk her horse before her vet got there and he ended up wedged against his barn and for the next sort of 45 minutes her and her vet were actually trying to get her horse up um, so that was valuable time that could have been spent um, trying to get this horse for treatment. So what should you be doing? Number one is to keep you safe um, so don't put yourself in any harm um, and just think about your horse's safety as well. So if they are violently rolling um, and you can get into the stable, take out any buckets, hay nets or any potential hazards from the area um, just to prevent any further injury. 
Um, if you are concerned about the fact that they are injuring themselves whilst rolling, um, you can actually move them, if it's safe to do so, um, to a small sand arena or a small paddock and just have them on the end of a lunge line and let them roll in the um, open space. But again, this is only if it's safe for you to do so. And please, please, please um, don't feed your horse. And um, this is something that vets told me over uh, and over again. Um, if there's an obstruction or a strangulation, if you feed your horse um, something else, it will just increase the pressure building behind the actual blockage. Um, and finally, just make sure you're ready for the vet to arrive um, and you're prepared to take action if um, your horse does need to go for referral. So your vet has arrived and unfortunately you have been given a critical diagnosis. So what are your options? Um, unfortunately, these situations do demand a life or death decision. So this is a decision that you must make very quickly. Um, and as um, Izzy touched on earlier, a common misconception amongst horse owners is that the term referral automatically means surgery. Um, and this can actually put some people off and delay their decision. Um, but just as um, it was explained earlier, the horse might just need referral for further observation or intensive medical treatment, such as fluid therapy, which can't be given out in the field. Um, and additionally, you may not have the facilities needed to perform the medical treatment. Um, for example, if your horse needs to be stabled in order to be starved, but he's actually field kept and there's no stable available, going to the hospital um, will just help solve this issue. Hang on, sorry. So another misconception is also um, surgery means death. Um, so yes, you know we all hear the stories that horses have died, um, but the fact the the thought that all horses die when they go for surgery is just not true. Um, our veterinary knowledge and skills are growing, um, and so too is the number of horses who actually survive. Um, but it's important to remember that there are several very important factors that can actually influence, as a, horse, uh, influence a horse's chances of survival. Um, so um, survival depends on their general health. So have they got any underlying issues going into surgery? Um, the actual cause and severity of colic. And also how quickly the horse was referred. So remember the first slide that we went over. Um, time can have a real effect on how severe the, the intestinal injuries are. And as Izzy mentioned, um, you know, some owners think that if surgery is not an option, they have no options. Um, but fear of social criticism and sort of the guilt of letting a horse down because for referral is not an option um, is a widespread um, amongst horse owners. Um, but if for whatever reason referral is not an option for you or your horse, it is absolutely fine to choose euthanasia because not doing anything will severely impact your horse's welfare. So please don't feel pressured to refer if this is not a realistic option um, and don't feel guilty for choosing it. Um, and the quote I've chosen on this slide, I think really sums this up um, and is associated with an owner who actually um, had her horse euthanized because of critical colic and because she knew that that horse, you know, wouldn't cope with the treatment. Um, and her friends actually made her feel really, really guilty afterwards um, for having opted for euthanasia rather than referral. Um, so please, please, please don't, don't, feel pressured to do this. So you know what decisions you'll have to make now, um, but what else can actually cause delays when you've made this decision and you want to get your horse um, to referral? Well, firstly, uh, there's not having transport available um, or finding that your horse box that you thought was in perfect working order has actually got a flat tire and won't start. Um, and then add to that the whole other le le layer of stress, um, trying to find somebody who can come out in an emergency um, if you don't have your own transport at 2 a.m. in the morning is going to be really, really difficult. Um, and the quote that I've used on here, a vet just said that, you know, you have to think about the distance to the hospital as well. So you might want to go for referral, but it might be a three hour journey. The next um, sort of area of delay is um, actually understanding. Um, so it's a, a general awareness that these situations are urgent. 
And although we hope that this webinar will have highlighted the importance of this, um, a poor understanding of colic and the importance of rapid decision making can still cause unforeseen delays in veterinary treatment. Um, and the vet I spoke to here said that he was actually waiting for an emergency colic to come down and he found that the owners had actually stopped off for tea on the way to bringing the horse to the hospital just because they hadn't realised the, the sort of emergency um, situation they were in. Next is something that I've mentioned before, and so is Izzy. Um, social pressure associated with what to do with a colicking course um, was a major finding of my PhD research. And the opinions of others can actually make a stressful situation much, much harder. So please remember that every situation will be different, uh, different and, and what's right for one horse is not right for another. So finance, um, it's always associated uh, with colic and is, is also a major concern. Um, and recently published research has highlighted that the average cost of colic surgery in the UK is around six and a half thousand pounds. Um, and that figure doesn't include any care following discharge. So you really need to think if that's something you could realistically afford for your horse. And if you've got insurance, just be aware that most UK policies only offer colic cover for up to about £5,000. So anything above that you will have to pay for. But the biggest thing that caused delays is actually the situation. So being in that situation um, itself can be so stressful that making a decision right there and then seems absolutely impossible, especially if you've never thought about it before, which is why we're here to sort of talk to you tonight and vets also do acknowledge this they they don't like breaking bad news to to owners because they know that this isn't a very nice decision for you to make um, but what we're going to talk about now will hopefully just ease this stress just a little bit so what can you do so prior preparation will not take away all of the stress um, but it can help you make difficult decisions really quickly should a critical case of colic happen to your horse so what you need to do is plan ahead. You need to get prepared and you really need to be ready to react if, if you want to get your horse to the hospital. So the first step is to go away and have a think about what you would want for your horse. Uh, would he or she cope with the referral process and sort of the duration of post-operative care? Or is euthanasia actually going to be the kindest option? As we keep on saying, you know, listen to the advice of others but this is ultimately your decision so it needs to be what will be best for both you and your horse um, and there's lots of resources available we've mentioned the react campaign and there's lots of resources around and don't forget to just give your vet a call and just have a chat with them if um referral is an option for you uh, make sure you're ready to react um, so keep all your emergency contact details together and somewhere really easy to find. Don't go and hide them in a cupboard that you will not be able to open um, in the dead of night. And also know what your insurance policy does and does not cover, as this really does catch owners out. If you do have your own transport, just make sure it's regularly maintained because you don't want to find that it won't start when you desperately need it. And if you don't have your own transport, just keep a list of trusted travel companies who will actually respond 24 seven and in an emergency. Um, and if your horse is tricky to load, just start about thinking about training them and um, maybe get some help and just see if you can get them to load nicely. And finally, and probably most important, importantly, get yourself a colic buddy. Um, this is someone you can call on day or night and they can help you support support you through this stressful event and the quote that i've chosen on here was um, a lady who really really um needed help both physically and mentally um throughout her experience um, and luckily her friend was uh, there just to just to help her um, because her horse was not very good um at traveling but what if you're not there and this is our number one top tip um, please share your emergency plans with others um, just in case you're stuck at work or you've gone away on holiday you really need somebody there that you can trust to make these decisions for you um, so share your emergency plan with your yard manager a trusted friend or even a family member and make sure that there's someone who can be contacted in an emergency should you be un unavailable now this all sounds good in theory i know uh, but what about in real life well I'm going to now tell you the story of Ronnie, 
Um, he's a, a lovely um, ex-racer on my yard um, and his owners, Ben and Steph, um, have had quite an interesting first year of ownership. Um, we also call him Sicknote and you will uh, learn why in a moment. So um, Ronnie came to uh, live with Ben and Steph last year um, and just a few months um, into owning him, um, they noticed that he was actually lying down quite a bit more than usual. They were still getting used to him, um, but it was something that they hadn't noticed him do, uh, do before. Um, and being such a subtle sign, they monitored, monitored him really closely. Um, but as soon as he started to pull the ground, they had the vet out to check him over. And the vet checked him over and um, said to continue to monitor him. Um, but a few hours later, um, he was no better. So the vet recommended referral. Um, they got him to the hospital by midnight um, and he had to go um, for surgery to correct a nephrosplenic entrapment. So um, part of his intestines had actually got stuck between his kidney and his spleen. Now, Ronnie was lucky. Um, he did really, really well. They, he was promptly referred um, and he was discharged um, a few days later. Now, I mentioned that we refer to him as sick note sometimes. Um, that's because just over three months later, Ronnie decided to colic again. Um, and he ended up back in the hospital. But luckily this time he didn't need a second surgery. Um, and within a, a week um, of being admitted, he actually went home. Now, despite their experiences, um, Steph and Ben would consider referring Ronnie again. But this is only if their vet felt that it was the best option for him. So they are aware that obviously things might not go the way that they want. Um, but because they would consider referring money, they want to be ready to react. So they've taken steps to prepare for such an event happening again, um, and just to make sure Ronnie has the best chances of survival. So they have done, um, got all of their documents in one place. Um, they know where to grab them um, at a moment's notice. Um, and my most favorite thing is they've actually created an emergency travel box, um, which is ready and is sat in the, the tech room and they can grab it with a moment's notice and it's got everything in it that Ronnie may need um, should it be sent to hospital. Um, so we actually got it out the other day. So he's got his overreach boots there, um, grooming kit, travel rug, spare head collars, um, water buckets, you name it, it's all in there. Um, and there's also emergency chocolate just in there, some sugary support for, for Steph when she has to go back to the hospital. Now, Steph says that knowing what's normal is also really, really important to be able to react quickly um, when your horse is unwell. Um, and having a good relationship with your vet and a plan in place should the worst happen really, really helped her. Um, she was really happy and um, to give their vet a call and just chat through everything with them. Um, and she also says that staying calm is really, really important because your horse is actually relying on you to make these decisions and losing the plot just really won't help, help the situation. Um, so have a plan in place and make sure you're ready. So that was a very brief introduction to um, emergency planning um, for colic. Um, but if there's one thing I'd just really like you to take away is prepare now. Um, it won't sort of save all of the heartbreak and the, the stress, but it really will help you make those decisions. And don't be afraid of doing what's best for you and your horse. Um, so yeah, I'd really like to thank World Horse Welfare and the University of Nottingham for supporting my research and to each and every horse owner and vet that shared their experiences with me. Um, and of course, Steph, Ben and Ronnie, um, who were absolutely fab for sharing all their photos and stories. So thank you. Brilliant. Um, Katie, thank you so much. And great, great to see Ronnie there. Um, Izzy, I've forgotten the name. What was the name of your, your horse and your case study? Um, Kai and his owner, Mary. Kai, Kai, Kai and, and, and Ronnie. Brilliant. Thank you. For, what resonated for me so much there, uh, Katie, was the fact that the, the preparation you're talking about. We do a just in case sort of a, a sort of a support for owners about, you know, about making decisions sh in, in an emergency situation, should you need to have your horse put to sleep or euthanized. And there's, there's so much parallel there. It's all of that, that preparation, isn't it? And that, 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 that's, that, um, 
preparation kit that R R Ronnie has. I think that's a, that's a wonderful sort of yeah. idea and just to show, show a really practical example. Um, so, so thank you for that. The, the questions have really started to come in. So, um, and if you, as a reminder, if you've got any questions, uh, do, do please put them through on the Facebook um, comments function or um, on the Q&A and chat functions within Zoom. Within Zoom, there's still a couple of people who've got their hands up. I can't go to you, but please just jot your, your questions down. Um, Melanie's given a, a great start here. She, she, unfortunately, she's had a, a warm blood that's got recurrent gassy colic with four emergency vet visits in six weeks, thought to be due to stress or a change in grass. And she said, interestingly, um, actually a couple of clinical signs that her horse shows is trying to pass urine so straining to pass urine or appearing to do so frantically swishing his tail um but she said um actually her horse is thankfully it seems to be better on daily probiotics but wondered and i suppose is this one for you would permanent damage have been caught to a uh, cause to his hind gut um it really depends and i think you know doing a, like a, a full medical workup you'd be able to possibly see if there's any any damage um but it's hard to say i mean especially with gassy colic yeah it can cause the the intestine to overstretch but it doesn't it depends where the gas is really um it's not going to cause such severe damage as say like a strangulation or something like that and i was saying before like gassy colics can be really difficult to budge even you know as a as a one-off and sometimes you're getting them sending them off to hospital because this horse has been colicking you know all day long and actually the trailer ride somehow it's cleared the gas and um and you know they arrive and they're fine but with a recurrent case um certainly you know having a few more investigations is a good idea and and it, it's really difficult um but that's that's really good that the probiotic is working um but yeah, it, it's it's very different for all, all cases, really. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, the question here, of, uh, Katie, around transport. Um, someone saying uh, that, that actually their nearest veterinary hospital is it's three hours away, um, and so obviously I consider it. Is, do you, is that a, still a viable option for treatment? It depends entirely on how quickly um, the size of him picked up um, and it's going to be something that you have to discuss with um, your vet based on their clinical signs. Um, so yes, it is still um, a viable option. Um, it just depends how quickly um, the signs have been caught and whether or not your vet feels that um, the horse is fit enough to go. Um, it's a really, really tri tricky one and there are quite a few owners that I spoke to that were in a similar situation. Um, it, yeah, it, it's a really, really tricky one. But, and I think it, it all got, depends on um, the circumstances at the time. Um, but I'd never rule it out. Brilliant. Um, qu question for um, you, Izzy. Um, can mild colic occasion, can mild colic occasionally be a sign of an underlying lipoma, which may later cause a severe colic? Um, yes. Possibly. Um, so rare, like usually, um, well, with the lipoma, so lots of horses can develop lipomas and especially as they get older um, and it's whether or not they kind of actually wrap around the gut and cause a, a strangulation, but that wouldn't necessarily, they're not going to be colicky until it does that. Now, some really stoical ponies, um, you know, it's more anecdotal really, but stoical ponies or like donkeys, for instance, they can show very mild signs and, and it's you know occasionally you do get ones which are you know incredible like they're just kind of ponies that you just don't you know usually see that and 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 they they actually do have a lipo like a strangulating lipoma but generally they will have more severe signs of colic um thank you very much um there's a question here or a comment um katie from lisa saying she's surprised about the view of not walking horses with colic yeah this is um a, it's a really controversial um topic um so in some some cases walking can be helpful um so if it's a really mild impaction um it can help to move the gut along um, if the horse is um, just showing intermittent signs and it is a really mild colic and it's safe to do so it can sort of distract the horse from wanting to roll um, but the the problem with it is um, 
if you walk a horse that's actually got a strangulation um, or an obstruction that's quite severe, you're actually get running the risk of exhausting the horse um, and reducing their chances and their options. Um, so if a, a vet arrives and, and does an assessment and says, OK, yep, yeah, um, we'll try some walking first or some um, really gentle lunging, then that's absolutely fine because they've had a look and have assessed the situation. Um, what we're finding is um, some owners choose to walk their horse for quite a long time. Um, so there have been reports of owners doing it for up to three hours before calling the vet um, and just choosing it as an option um, to see if they can solve the issue first before calling the vet in. Um, so we're just trying to make sure that the situation is assessed first um, and then moving from there. And then Debbie, probably just, I mean, sorry, uh, Kate, just follow up with that with a question from Debbie, who I'm glad she clarified her question. I wasn't quite sure what she meant, but she said, do you think taking the horse in the trailer can sometimes relieve colic pressure? Like Izzy said, that some we don't know why um, it it just can do sometimes, um, but it shouldn't it shouldn't be that sort of go to treatment just because it worked for one horse, it might not work for another, and it might actually end up causing more problems. Brilliant, thank you, um, Izzy. D D Francesca's asked. I lost a horse in two thousand and six, eighteen months after surgery for epiploic foramen entrapment. Um, obviously, quite a rare cause of colic. Has survival rates improved now for this? Yeah, so that is a nasty, nasty type of colic, um, and survival rates. I think they are generally lower um, than for some other types. Um, I don't know between 2006 and then if they have improved, I, I would have to review the literature and get back to you. Um, and then that's something I can do. Um, you, if you send your question into education at wildhorsewelfare.org, we can reply to you on there. But no, that's quite a specific question, but definitely that's a very nasty, nasty cause of colic and it's not the most common. Absolutely. And, and I suppose just another, I mean, that one especially, you know, time is of the essence, isn't it? Unless you've got that, the quicker you get to it, the better Absolutely. jump. So I should imagine that's a key driver of it. Um, another one for you, Izzy. Um, how often is colic caused by melanoma? And is there anything specific to watch out for horses with melanoma? Yeah, so it's, it's hard to tell, really. Um, so classically with melanomas, you see them in older grey horses and, you know, any old grey horses are likely, most are going to have melanomas and you can see them on the outside but often they are also on the inside um, but that's not something you can see um, and so with melanomas you don't really know, I mean sometimes they can, I've, I've, I've seen some colics where ponies they've got melanomas on the outside and they do get mild bouts of colic because often what can happen is they can get melanomas um, that kind of run in their ab abdomen and these can also they can occupy the space and cause like pain from just the fact that they're occupying the space um, and you know cause a bit of a problem and again if they have them like around their anus and stuff that can also obstruct the passage of feces as well um, and you know that is that is something to think about but generally you know lots of older horses do have melanomas and it's just something to always have at the back of your mind they can get colic but you know it's yeah it, it's hard it's hard to tell and every every pony of melanomas is different really brilliant thank you um katie question um for, from facebook uh, do certain plants cause colic that's a very good question and um i'm gonna say is it? I presume so. Um, I think it will be, um, you know, any poisonous plant, if the, if the horse can come across it, um, can do so. Um, there is also, um, especially now in autumn, um, atypical myopathy is also something that we're really concerned about, which is uh, associated with um, sycamores, uh, the little helicopter seeds, and also the seedlings. And they can actually um, show horses that have eaten quite a bit and have been affected by the, the toxins in these plants can actually start to show really violent um, colic signs. Um, and be really, really quite unwell. And same for acorns. So acorns and sycamores are probably the, the two that, that are quite, quite bad. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Izzy, do you want to add to that? I was just going to add, yeah. So atypical myopathy can often look like, like colic, but often the thing that kind of def makes them different is that often atypical myopathy horses usually have like 
their appetite. They haven't lost their appetite, which is with colic, they usually do lose their, their appetite. But no, I would, I would agree with Katie. I'd just say to add to that list, lush grass, we just, we always see so many gassy colics with lush grass and we'll, you know, every, every time, and then we'll try and get owners to keep their horses off the lush grass. And it's not always practical, but it's just something that always triggers off colic. Absolutely. Um, as a, you've got a great question from, well, a, yeah, great question from Nicaragua. And it sort of um, got my notice because it's um, dexamethasone, which we've been reading so much about in, in, in the media uh, for very different reasons. But um, Izzy, um, we've got a question. What do you think about dexamethasone as a part of a treatment to keep the, keep the, the horse from a shock? From, for, yeah, from shock. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so dexamethasone. So in the UK, as a first line treatment, we don't tend to use dexamethasone. Um, but it's something I'm trying to think. So I haven't worked in a in a surgical environment in hospital. Um, but it, it doesn't it doesn't tend to be something that we would classically use. It would be something we would use if they had like um, diarrhea alongside those symptoms. So if they've got some kind of um, yeah, bowel issues that are causing them to have like an aggravated bowel, then, then we, we would use DEX. And you know, it's, it's our vet's favorite, it's our favorite drug. And when they announced that they're using it for coronavirus, we all smugly being like, oh, well, of course they would be using DEX. But I think, I think they've been using it for coronavirus a long time before. They just haven't published the research, but um, yeah, it's it's our uh, a favourite drug, but it's not something I would typically use unless they've got diarrhoea. Absolutely, thank you, and and of course, you know, the, the great care needs to be taken with using any steroid in horses isn't there absolutely um Katie, there's a question here, a really good one from from Marie. You know, um, what about what, you, you get a referral and then it confirmed the horse needs surgery and then the horse is put down due to cost. The horse has then gone through that travel prior to being euthanized is that is that right there is no wrong or right answer with this um if you're if sorry i should actually ask katie days uh, marie actually has how often do people how often does that happen so that's actually a really really good question so um it happens quite a lot um, so a lot of the, the research studies that um, show survival um, rates and things like that actually give a biased view of how many horses are actually euthanized because um, it's not necessarily because of the colic and um, sometimes it's because of the cost. Um, so sometimes horses do get to, to referral centres and the owners find that actually they're not going to be able to afford the long um, term costs. Um, but in terms of whether it's right or wrong, um, if you can't afford the, the surgery, there is no point in putting yourself in a situation where you're going to be in debt, you're going to be financially um, unable to, to sort of live your life. Um, and it is much kinder to put your horse to sleep. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really, really good question. Yeah. It's always such a challenge, you know? and and I think that one of the key messages there, isn't it, is to is to think about these things when your horse is well. So we always say, especially about manage thinking about sort of end of life, you know, to, to sort it out when you're when you're happy and your horse is happy, and then when the when the pressure's on, you'll be able to make those decisions so much. It'll always be difficult, but at least you'll have. Yeah, absolutely. At least you know you've thought about it beforehand, and, and you sort of not at peace with your decision, but you know what you you would do in that situation. Brilliant. Um, thank you for all the questions. We're, I'm, I'm beginning to struggle, but we'll do my best. Um, Wendy's asks, um, Izzy, I lost my 20 year old pony to colic two weeks after mild laminitis. Is there a link? Um, I'm sorry to hear about your loss, Wendy. Um, so with, well, with, with laminitis, it is a stressful event. Um, and, you know, that can trigger probably I'd say more milder colics. I think for the more serious types of colic, it is, and I don't know, I, 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 can't, I can't see what type of colic your pony had, but if you, if you lost them, I assume it must've been quite a, a bad type of colic. Um, so I, it isn't necessarily linked um, if it's, it's more to do with the anatomy. And especially given that he's older, they are more prone to things like strangulating lipomas um, and that is not necessarily linked with laminitis. Yeah. We talked about not feeding horses. Someone's asked, should I stop getting them to drink water if they've, if they've suspected colic? 
No, always let them um, have water. Um, the only thing I'd say is if um, the bucket is becoming a hazard, if they've got a bucket of water, then maybe remove it. Um, but no, always allow them access to water because um, in the case of sort of impactions, that's going to help um, with that. Um, but yeah, it's just just more the food. Fine. OK. Um, Izzy, Suze asks, my pony has spasmodic colic some two months ago. It can be rather gassy and infrequently has small poos. Um, what would you suggest to reduce the gas? You talked about gassy colics. And yeah, absolutely. And often these can be related to, to management. And, and if something's changed in their management and, and the grass, as I was saying before, um, and, you know, I know what you mean though, by those small poos and quite often, yeah, you kind of, when you do a rectal examination, you can feel that lots of gas and, and, and small poos. And, and often, especially in older ponies, it seems, I don't know if your pony's older, but that does seem to be a thing um anecdotically <laughs> not from research studies um but i i would say look look at your look at your management and just check you know are they having a lifestyle as close to possible like a natural horse would have so not too much lush green grass and like it's better to, well it's, it's hard in the uk but better to be on like kind of sparse grass grasslands um and you know living out as much as possible but and moving about but you know it's it's always it's hard to manage but i i probably review what your your pony's eating um and you know and it's exercise as well and you know it's always good with gassy colics to keep them moving if you can and a question I mean, it's a comment from debbie here and i think you know just because there's a number of different techniques of, of walking lunging uh taking out in a trailer but just because it doesn't work in one incident doesn't mean it's not it, it's, it's very obviously it's type specific isn't it so yeah. you know just because something hasn't worked previously with a, a previous case if if you're unlucky to have a more than mm -hmm. one then it doesn't mean it's gonna impact on necessarily on the next one um is he, is there a hormonal link to colic? Uh, someone just said that their mare suffered impaction colic m most months over the summer, over a few years, with no sudden changes to routine, feeding or exercise. Interesting. Um, I, I'm not aware of a, of a humor, uh, hormonal link. Um, but I mean, if, if it was, say, if you were kind of to record it, it like sometimes with um, hormones, it's really useful to record you know how often this is um ha happening and then you can compare it to a mare's easter cycle and if it's happening like every three weeks you're like mm, maybe there is a link um but if it and, and, and horses are kind of seasonal polyesterous which means they're in season in the summer but not in the winter months but yeah and in, it is impaction comments are colics are more common in the winter generally speaking because horses are stabled more um but say she was stable more in, in the summer, that could be a reason. Um, but yeah, it, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of a hormonal link. Brilliant, thank you, Izzy. Um, Katie, do, do, um, I think it's come to me privately, but Sonia has given a, a, a very, um, um, oh God, I mean, I, I feel for you, Sonia, in terms of what you went through, but the bottom line is she was saying, you know, having a plan, it may, just makes it all the difference. She lost her horse to colic and, you know, I have a plan now for each of my horse and it, it differs for each one. Um, and I think Caramel was the horse she lost, but she, she, she's just reiterating the importance of that plan. Yeah, no, sorry, you know, sorry to hear that, Sonia. And, and yeah, it's, it, just having that plan and knowing what it, you as an owner you will know what what your horse can and and, and can't do and um you know what will impact it more um so just knowing that you've got that plan in place just in case it is you know such a stress of an event you know that you've thought about it beforehand and you can say yes he's going to be fine if he goes through surgery and if it's a possibility or no he's just not going to cope um, I think that's really, really good. Um, so it's really nice, uh, lovely that you've thought about all your different horses and you've got that plan in place. But, you know, it, I am sorry uh, for Car Caramel. Is it Caramel? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's sad. Um, Izzy, question um, from Janet. We were told by a vet that the horse, if a horse is rolling, there's a chance their, gut, their gut has already twisted. Um, yeah, so, so I think as what Katie was saying is that um, if they're rolling, they're not necessarily, that's not going to twist their gut. Um, but, you know, horses will roll with 
uh, like uh, all the different underlying causes of colic. It doesn't necessarily mean they've got a twisted gut. That's only one type of colic. So they could roll with, with spasmodic colic or gas colic or an impaction. Um, and, you know, I think the point is, is that, um, that they're only, they're only going to roll to relieve the pain, as Katie was saying. Um, it's not going to cause their gut to twist. Um, and, you know, they might be rolling because they've got a twisted gut, but that's actually one of the rarer types of colic. Um, and it's probably more, you know, the chances are more likely it's going to be a milder colic. Thank you. Uh, we are almost out of time. Um, a question from Chris, uh, Katie, can clover cause horses to be more gassy? My field has presently got a lot of clover um, and um, it, my pony often comes in fairly gassy. Not that I know of. I don't know if you know, Izzy. Yeah, and I think also it slightly depends on the individual pony as well. Um, and, you know, a bit like us like some will be more sensitive to some types of you know grass and clover and that kind of thing and especially clover it's very green and you know it's it can you know trigger it make, can make some horses hyper you know some people say that so it really it does slightly depend on the pony but i'd say if your pony is there, there is a lot of gas uh, there is a lot of clover and your pony is quite gassy i probably if there's any chance of like trying to restrict the amount on the clover, that would be my advice. Yeah. Um, Katie, a question from Rebecca. W will my vet be able to tell me in the field if my horse is surgical or not? I have a 21-year-old wind-sucking X-racer and surgery would not be an option. Okay. Um, so, as Izzy was saying, with sort of the, the diagnostic tests that a vet can do in the field, um, vets are limited to what they can do. Um, but what they'll base their um, sort of advice on or the recommendations is um, that the horse's clinical signs. So Izzy was saying sort of their heart rate, um, you know, what amount of pain they think they're in, um, whether they think they're systemically stable to, um, to go on to surgery, um, and whether or not, um, Izzy mentioned sort of their response to analgesia, if, if a horse isn't responding to um, pain relief, then that does more often than not um, indicate that the, the, the colic is surgical or it needs some sort of um, intensive intervention. So yes, um, the, the vet will be able to, to advise you whether or not um, your horse does need surgery. Brilliant. I think we're almost out of time. We've got a lovely message from Mary about Kai and just saying how well uh, the, the vet practice looked after Kai on arrival. And so we're just trying to reassure people, but, but there's great care there. Um, and um, do, uh, do, maybe just to finish off, Izzy, on the, the issue of social pressure. In terms of planning, um, what, what can people do to, to not be so um, potentially negatively impacted by social pressure in their decision making? Um, so I think, as Katie was saying, it's always best to come up with a plan in the first place. And, you know, if you've got, say, your colic buddy who, you know, your friend on the yard who kind of, you know, knows your plan and you've kind of got an alliance, that's that's probably going to help as well. Um, ultimately, it, it is really hard, but you just have to, you know, stand your ground. And it's much, it's easier said than done when you've got everyone around you. Um, and you know they've all got their ideas as well and it's just really important to just have your own plan and and listen to the vet and don't be afraid if, if there's loads of people around just say can I have space just my horse the vet and me and if you don't want people there like you 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 can say that and, and I've so often been in situations when you know there have been people not being helpful so yes it, it, but it's, it's always difficult so listen, we've um, we've run out of time. I'm I'm so sorry. We've tried to get through many questions, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll need to draw it to a close. But um, I thought I'd just come to you, Katie, and and um, ask you what having heard the discussions and obviously the great sort of questions we've had. What 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 are your final thoughts? Um. Yeah, I think uh, colic is obviously something that all owners are, are very, very um, concerned about. And we are trying to now share our research and, and making sure that owners are aware of what's going on and, and the developments and things. Um, so my final thoughts are, you know, keep up to date, um, it, have your plan in place and, and just do what's best for you and your horse. Um, and, and just like Izzy's just said, don't, don't feel pressured into something that is not right for you. Um, so being prepared and, and knowing what's best. Brilliant. Izzy, your final thoughts from you? Yeah, um, just yeah, being calm and just remembering that most colics, so, you know, 80% can be resolved with one vet 
visit. And I know we've we talked a lot about critical cases and it's important to have those plans. But I mean, I know when I was 13, my pony had colic and he was off his food and I was distraught. And that was the only symptom he was showing. And it was just mild spasmodic colic, but I was very upset by it. And it's and it is an emotional time, but you know, just just try and try and stay calm and remember. Yeah, most most of the time it is mild and can be easily resolved. Brilliant. Thank you so much to to Katie and to Izzy for sharing your, your practical knowledge and know how that's been really helpful. And thank you so much to everyone for your contributions tonight. Um, firstly, we've put in the chat function there on the um, on on Zoom and we'll put it onto the, the YouTube page as well. The links to the BHS and University of Nottingham um, um, th sort of webinars and and other sort of resources there around colic so please do go in and, and and take a look at that i want to say thank you sorry as ever for not being able to get to all the questions and thank you so much for so many people sharing what i know have been really emotional and difficult stories who've lost um horses to colic i hope today has provided some reassurance for you but also for everyone and i think the con the consistency of the messages came through around there around the react sort of model around planning and 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 just um, and really preparing for what those difficult decisions that might come if hopefully they'll never come but if they do if you've planned you, you you'll be in so much a better place so thank you so much for joining us for, the, for tonight's webinar as I said earlier, if you've enjoyed it, please do uh, share the link, uh, the YouTube um, and on Facebook with, with your friends, uh, family and colleagues. Um, I hope that you'll be able to join us in a couple of weeks time for our next Wednesday webinar. And if you have um, any ideas and subjects you'd like us to cover on these Wednesday webinars, then please do let us know by emailing us education at worldhorsewelfare dot org in the meantime i hope to see you in a fortnight uh thank you so much for joining us take care and especially look after those horses and get planning